It is 5.02 and I'm gonna call uh, the meeting of the board to order. Um, could I get a motion to establish the agenda? So moved. Um, no, I know. Any second? Oh. <laughs> second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passes. Um, we will proceed. Uh, I'm going to hand things over to Superintendent Koloski. I think we might be changing the order a little bit. Just a little bit. We are going to um, start with our student representative report before we go into our student recognition. So I am now going to turn it over to our student representatives. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Um, so we're very sad that we missed the last meeting due to various conflicts and illnesses, but we're happy to be back today, and we're so happy to see so many students being recognized today. So, okay, here we go. Last month, Wes Mercer displayed their skill in an amazing talent show. Teachers and students also enjoyed Book It Beater's production of New Shoes, which spread the messages of equity and, and empathy. Northwood is home to several Global Reading Challenge winners and also held its first ever Family Math Night. Families enjoyed games and the idea that productive struggle is important when learning new concepts. Both West Mercer and Northwood had visits from authors this, this month and students enjoyed hearing how an author or artist's journey impacts their work. Both schools are also preparing for state testing beginning at the end of the month and teachers and students have been reflecting on progress and adjusting learning goals accordingly. The character dare for the month of March at IMS is respect. They are defining respect as treating others with dignity and esteem, and students are focused on appreciating the people, places, and things that make our everyday world possible. Character dares include thanking someone who has served the community or doing a chore without being asked. Some important dates from this month, month for IMS are last Friday, which was the last day of the second semester, second trimester, and this past Tuesday marked the beginning of 6th and 7th grade registration. On March 2nd, the IMS Science Olympiad team participated in their first regional competition with great success, and throughout March, the IMS library has held several opportunities for students to honor Women's History Month and participate in March Book Madness. On March 9th, the IMS band, orchestra, and choir participated in the East Shore Solo and Ensemble Festival. March 20th was an all-district choir concert at MIHS, and tonight and tomorrow night, there is an IMS play performance of three one-acts, Lord of the Pies, Appropriate Audience Behavior, and Not-So-Grim Tales. <laughs> Most significantly, most significantly at MIHS, there has been a lot of discussion recently about stopping hateful language and actions. In response to several publicized acts of hate committed by young people, MIHS staff and students are refocusing on the importance of respect, empathy, and kindness towards our peers. Um, in these reports, we often talk a lot about character dares or celebrated traits of the month in the elementary and middle schools but these past few weeks have challenged high schoolers in a very real way to access these essential emotions or traits and apply them to our current difficult and painful situation. Trying to move on from the instances that occurred, throughout the last three weeks we have had discussions led by counselors and school admin, um, a student-led unity assembly, and students have drawn blue hearts on their hands as a symbol of friendship and respect. Most recently, the district-wide Day of Unity broadcast last Friday on 88.9 The Bridge, the high school radio station. The full day was dedicated to filling the airspace with positive messages and music, highlighting the great community that is Mercer Island. Especially unifying was that the day was a district-wide Blue Spirit Day, and thanks to Ms. Koloski for sending an email to the whole staff and seeing so much participation was really, really happy making me happy. <laughs> <laughs> a class from IMS even called in to the station together to request a song. Thank you especially to Ms. Kloski again. Yeah, we would like to make it clear to all of you, very clear, that MIHS students understand that under no circumstances are acts of hate acceptable and are in fact very hurtful and deeply personal to many of our friends and classmates. We also acknowledge this, that this was not the first time that this kind of behavior has been seen from students at our school, both on and off campus. We hope that the recent incident and subsequent response can be a turning point uh, for the conversation and culture surrounding these sensitive subjects at MIHS. On a lighter note. <laughs> <laughs> So 
at the high school, ASB elections have begun, and MI won a coat, dive, coat drive competition against Bellevue, and spring sports are off to a great start. There are an astounding 521 student athletes this spring. MIH's radio students won big at the national level, and you're going to see it. many DECA students have placed at state and will be traveling to Florida for the next competition. And the newly formed HOSA team at MIHS also participated in a statewide competition with great success. MIHS also hosted the East Shore Band One Festival recently um, with a reimagined format. So shout out to the band student advisory for pulling it off wonderfully. Additionally, the jazz bands also played at the Mead Jazz Northwest competition in Spokane, and the jazz ensemble won first in their division, as well as the Sweepstakes Award, which is given to the best of all participants present. Congrats to them. Coming up, robotics will be participating in a tournament, and multiple destination imagination teams will be competing in state this weekend. The bio symposium where high schoolers studying biology presented projects and experiments on which they have been working on throughout the year was also a great success this past month. Fine Arts Showcase with the, was this past Tuesday and Wednesday. This district-wide event celebrated the visual and performing arts at all six schools with students, parents, teachers, and administrators all in attendance. <laughs> the two of us also traveled to Olympia last Thursday with Principal Puckett, Superintendent Koloski, and Board President Janini Upton uh, to talk about talk to our state reps and senators about the importance of student safety and success. Yeah, there we are. <laughs> um, it was a really great learning experience for both of us. Um, we got some great ideas about amplifying student voice in relation to state policy. And on a slightly related note, the search for next year's junior student rep on the school board is underway. Applications are being ex accepted, and the teachers are submitting recommendations for current sophomores. So thank you for listening to this long and slightly more serious student report. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, and I hope you enjoyed the, the pictures you can see. Um, they ha had a great opportunity with each of our legislative reps and um, did a fabulous job representing our district down in Olympia. So it was um, thrilling to get to make up that day because we were disappointed when it was canceled because of the snow. So I think we had a good day all in all. Moving on now to our celebrations and recognitions. As mentioned, we have several groups here from the high school. They have been very busy as we move into spring at the high school. We have actually three different recognitions and we're going to start with a single recognition in our fine arts department in the drama department. Um, every year, the MIHS drama department hosts a school Shakespeare competition. And the winners then go on to compete at the Seattle Shakespeare competition. And a group of two to three English teachers serve as the judges, and students compete with a Shakespearean monologue up to 20 lines long. So this year, MIHS sent two students, Manisha Maru and Katie Parkinson, to the final competition. And Katie, who is here with us tonight, um, is well known in our theater community here, has performed in many MIHS and Youth Theater Northwest productions. She performed a monologue from Two Gentlemen of Verona and one of Shakespeare's sonnets at the event sponsored by the Seattle branch of the English Speaking Union, ESU. And Katie placed first. <laughs> and even more exciting, especially for an actor, is she will now move on to the national competition on April 29th in what other place? New York City. Um, and our drama teacher, Daniela Melgar, is Daniela here? She could not be here today. Oh, she could not be here. Well, kudos to her as well. I know she's excited for Katie also, and we'll be traveling with her to the finals. Katie, congratulations, and why don't you share a little bit with the board about your experience? Sure. Um, yeah, my, my dad is here with me today. Thanks for coming. <laughs> uh, so I've competed in this competition since my sophomore year and I went, I competed at the state level my sophomore year but did not place. So it was really gratifying to be able to return my senior year and um, win the competition. I'm really excited to go to New York. Uh, my drama teacher and my mom will be joining me in New York to watch me compete. Um, and yeah, 
should be really fun. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And now, as is tradition, we always ask our, our oh. student recognition to come on up and um, take a picture for our communications coordinators. So why don't you come up the back okay, way, Katie? Good. There's only one of you, but that's okay. We'll squish it. <laughs> squish it, squish it. <laughs> there, and then Craig will get the picture. David might need to move in. Next up, we would like to recognize our HOSA, which is something new at Mercer Island High School. And um, Ms. McClellan and the students are going to come forward. HOSA stands for Future Health Professionals. Um, it's originally um, Health Occupation Student Association. I only know that because I've had a fair amount of experience with HOSAs. It's a great organization. And um, so it's specific to students who are interested in professional health careers. And the HOSA chapter at MIHS was incorporated just last year and participated for the very first time this year in the state competition. And their membership has tripled and 26 students competed at state on March 8th in Spokane. Seven students have now qualified to attend the national HOSA competition in Orlando, Florida in June, representing Mercer Island High School in the state of Washington. And we have here with us two student members, as well as our co-advisors, Jen McClellan and Jamie Cook. So students, if you could introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about your role in HOSA. Sure. Hello, my name's Naomi Lewis. I'm the president of HOSA. Um, my name's Lindsay Shu, and I'm the treasurer of HOSA. Um, so what we do at HOSA is um, we prepare our members to compete at a state level competition in Spokane every year um, in a multitude of different events that are related to um, several, health so several health occupations. Um, they can compete in knowledge tests, which are just written tests, or they can compete in skill-based tests, where they actually demonstrate the skills they have accumulated through their studying and work in different topics. So, for instance, I competed this year um, at state competition in a written transcultural healthcare test, as well as a skills forensic science test. Um, so I competed this year um, for medical terminology as a written test and I'm lucky enough to place first in state and then going to international with five others um, of my teammates. So Naomi Lewis won second place in transcultural um, uh, medicine test and then we have four members in a team event called um, public service announcement and they, they placed fourth but they got um, Got to have the honors to go to st um, the international conference as well. Okay. Um, I really, Jennifer McClellan here, co-advisor. Jamie Cook does all the hard work. He's the biology, biotech person. <laughs> um, I do the paperwork. Uh, I really want to call out particularly these two students, Naomi and Lindsay, um, in terms of a true student leader. They, they were the ones that actually approached us and said we'd love a HOSA chapter, which is actually larger than DECA nationally, so it's a really big organization, um, and said we want one. And they have done all the heavy lifting, so really um, huge kudos to both of them for living into that student leadership piece. My name is Jamie Cook. Uh, I was approached to be an advisor. I said, sure. And uh, it really is a student-led organization. I let them go and kind of got them a little bit. But really, they are, they are the ones that made it happen. We've got triple uh, membership this year. I'm sure there'll be a lot more coming. So we're really excited. Congratulations, students. And we look forward to hearing the results. It's in June, so it'll, I know it's late after school gets out. But um, we are excited for you. And HOSA is an amazing nationwide organization. So congratulations. And we, again, would love for you to all come on up and get a shot with the board.
and now our Mercer Island High School DECA. DECA sent their team of 92 students who had qualified in area competition in January to the state competition at March, on March 1st at the Maiden Bower Center in Bellevue. DECA is a career and technical organization specific to our business and marketing students and provides a venue where they may apply their knowledge in such events as competitive role plays, addressing case studies, submitting 30-page international business plans, 20-page business operations research plans, and other events or projects. With an overall chapter membership of 207 students, Mercer Island High School is the fifth largest in the state and represents our island community and school with professionalism and keen business and marketing insight. Mercer Island High School had 27 students called to um, stage for the awards portion of the state DECA with either a recognition um, in an aspect of their event, the test or role play, or as a placement in the event. Those that placed are now qualified to attend the International DECA event in Orlando, Florida. I wonder why they keep picking Orlando. It's I think there's enough. something it's there. It's big enough, is what it is, yeah. <laughs> At the end of April, so they'll be going soon. In addition, um, a specific congratulations to Emily Rowe on her year serving as the Area 3 DECA State <laughs> Vice President. She represented our area, which includes the school districts from Duval to Mercer Island. She will also travel to Orlando to represent the State of Washington for International DECA. Congratulations, students. Thanks for being here, and we can't wait to hear from each of you as to um, your recognition. <laughs> Just, in, just introduce yourself and then what you've competed with at DECA. Okay, hi, I'm Emily. Um, I'm a senior, and this year I competed in a paper category. I wrote an international business plan and then in automotive services, a role play. Uh, I'm Blake Lieber. Um, I did uh, the 30 page in well, the 30-page. Um, I did accounting applications last year. Uh, <laughs> I don't, I think I did marketing this year. <laughs> Hi, my name is Benjamin Holders Gross. Uh, this year I also competed in the 30 page international business plan uh, category and I also competed in the role play category of quick serve food marketing. Uh, my name is James Watson and I did the international business plan as well and then I also competed in the marketing management team role play event. Um, my name's Emma Pfeiffer, and I competed in the International Business Plan and then the Team Business Law and Ethics role play. Hi, I'm Francesca Risco, and I competed in the Accounting Applications role play. Hi, my name's Elena Briggs, and I complete, competed in Personal Financial Literacy. Hi, my name is Lila Schroff, and I competed in Human Resource Management. Hi, my name is Tara Manhas, and I competed in Human Resource Management and the 20-page uh, Business operation, Operations Research Paper. My name is Mari Nielsen, and I competed in the Accounting Applications Role Play. Um, I'm Angelina Barocas, and I did the 30-page International Paper, and I also did my role play in uh, Marketing Management. Hi, I'm Drew Taguchi, and I competed in the Team Entrepreneurship Role Play. So I'm uh, Jennifer McClellan, and um, I'm one of the advisors. So Shannon Tapp couldn't be here, but uh, Joe Bryant's one of our other advisors in the building, so there's three of us. And I just wanted to um, say publicly thank you to the board, thank you to our teachers and our administrators, because um, uh, we get we get them. So we get them as DECA students, and we get to compete with them, and they are so incredibly prepared and capable, and the extemporaneous speaking where they have to solve the problems on the spot in front of judges is extraordinary, and we know that it's because we have this district that just believes in, in uh, uh, educating the whole child and and so they are remarkable students you should you should feel so proud that they're representing us um, locally at state and internationally so uh, super proud of them sometimes I feel like I, sh I don't have any right standing in front of them they are far smarter than I am so just want to say thank you to all of you come on over let's all fit in and we'll get a group shot picture for all of our DECA students 
And any parents of any of these award-winning students who are here with us tonight, raise your hand or at least stand up so we can say thank you to you and they can say thank you to you as well. Congratulations to all of the students um, and their teachers for all of these honors. Um, we do love seeing and hearing about what you guys do. Um, we are going to move on to um, Section 2, Full Governance Process Monitoring, Board Policy 2020, Fundamental 7, Equity and Inclusion. So I believe I'll hand it over to Fred Rendell. Yes, staff is going to make their way to the table. They're all being tentative to see who's, who's gonna go first, so I will fill the gap a little bit while as they get ready to present for Fundamental 7. Just a, a couple of notes for the board. On the, attached to the Fundamental is of course the report as well as the um, revised superintendent interpretation. This is one of the ones that is being revised this year. Um, that's just for your preview. We'll talk about it more um, next week. It's only a week away because we're not doing, we've got spring break coming. So um, with all that said, I will turn it over now to um, Assistant Superintendent Rendell and Director Prescott. Great. So. Um this is a level in our new level reporting system. Uh, this is a level two report tonight. Uh, this will be the final level two of the fundamentals for the year. And so um, per the way we've typically done it, uh, Jamie and I will start off with a, an overview of some of the uh, quantitative indicators that you've asked for over the years for us to, to measure uh, progress towards this fundamental on fostering and embracing diversity inclusiveness and equity, and then we'll turn it over to our school teams who will talk about initiatives they've been working on since uh, last March, uh, all the way around um, in the same regard with some of the, the uh, qualitative indicators. Um, want to begin by starting on the first page with our quantitative indicators, um, which is a broad overview of the demographics <coughs> across the, the district. The, uh, the demographics that we use with respect to um, race and ethnicity are the same ones we use as part of the federal categories. So these are the ones that are reported by families when they're enrolling in the school district. Of note uh, here, uh, while some demographics have shown um, general, gener uh, fairly stable um, numbers over the years, I think the two that have shown the biggest change continue to be um, students and families who identify as white and you can see a gradual decline over time um, in that category. And then the most significant increase over time has been two or more races in those students who are and families that report um, uh, that identity. We don't know what those two races are, and I think that question comes up as to do we, can we tease that out? And um, it's simply put two or more races, so um, where those are, so we don't, we don't have those. I think it's also interesting to take a look on page two at the comparison between who our kindergartners and our first graders are and who are our juniors and our seniors. And so um, over um, the last several years, uh, we continue to see that um, when you compare uh, those students who are uh, kindergartners and first graders, um, families reporting uh, um, an identity as Asian, uh, continues to be outpacing um, those who compared to the grade 11 and 12. You see the, the um, demographic of those who identify as white, and you have that discrepancy between 52% of our kindergartners and our first graders compared to 67% of our current juniors and seniors. Uh, similarly, those students with, who identify two or more races, that continues to um, have a, quite a discrepancy with 14.9% of our kindergarten and first graders compared to just 6.8% uh, 
of our 11th and 12th graders. So our, um, our demographic change continues to occur across all grade levels, but there's a definite difference um, in our diversity between who's coming into our schools um, versus who's graduating out. Um, this year, the ELL parent survey, that's an every other year survey, so that's why um, we don't have any new data to report there. So I want to move on to the highly capable uh, demographic distribution uh, of notable... Actually, could I yes. ask on the ELL survey, do we give it in multiple languages or is it just in English? We do. We have 37 languages that are provided to us. Actually, we use the, the same survey as OSPI uses. Um, and there are 37 pre-translated languages and then we translate any others that we need to. So, yeah. so we give them both options. Thank you. Um, in the highly capable demographic distribution, um, going back seven years ago, um, we certainly had that uh, discrepancy between gender where our boys were outpacing our girls um, with respect to those receiving services in the highly capable um, program. If you look now and compare that to uh, the trend we've been on since 1415, um, and we really started to see a, a shift in 1314, but you can see now that our demographic is almost proportionate to, um, to the general population in terms of gender. And so it's just noted in there that with the gender, with 53.8% uh, of our student population being male and 56.4% of the high, highly capable students being um, male, we almost have a perfect proportionality now. I would note, uh, Jamie and I were talking about this in preparation, that our students who in our most recent uh, testing were now starting to see girls outpace boys um, by margins that we may have to look at for the exact opposite reason than the first time we were looking at it. So we'll continue to look at that. But remember, this is a K-12 perspective on that. Um, <coughs> any questions on that section? Or I'll turn it over to Jamie. In looking at the academic course access, um, we're looking for a 1.0. If we did 1.0, then that would be perfectly proportionate. And so anything significantly below or above 1.0 um, causes us to pause. And um, when we look, we're, we're doing relatively well in most categories with the exceptions of um, black African American students. And we notice that we've not been able to move that needle uh, as far as enrolling in honors and AP courses, despite a significant number of efforts and um, things done by the high school administration, counselors, teachers, um, trying to promote that and trying to figure out if there are any barriers or obstacles that are impeding the ability for students, any student who wants to, to enroll in, and succeed in those courses. Um, so that is something that I think we've highlighted is, you know, how do we, how do we continue to, to work on this and focus on it and see an increase. Um, so that is definitely an area that we are continuing to look at. Um, another piece down at the bottom, um, you know, you'll see that our 504 students, um, they do actually have a perfect proportionality <laughs> ratio, um, but we, we still have students in special education who are not, we're, we haven't moved that needle either. Um, and so we want to make sure students are successful in what they're doing, but we also want to make sure that there's nothing that's impeding their ability to pursue whatever their academic interests are. Quick question. Um, as far as this data goes, is it if a student is in one class or do you count multiple in yeah. some way? Any, any, any single okay. Thank you. course. In looking at our athletic participation, and I know our Title IX committee uh, just met as recently as this week, I believe, um, and so we continue to uh, monitor uh, our compliance with Title IX. If we take a look at a couple of um, items to note in terms of athletic participation, um, there was a, we were wondering what would happen with the data this year because we reduced not the number of sports that are offered, but the number of teams that are offered um, by four. So we have four fewer teams across all of the um, uh, all of the high school, and we weren't sure what that might do to the distribution. And the decisions to reduce that were really making sure that we had um, competitive opportunities um, 
for students and that we weren't completely depleting the experience of the students who were participating. Um, fortunately, we did not see any change in terms of the participation um, by boys and girls. And you can see that um, at both IMS and at the high school, over time we've had a fairly stable um, uh, and positive participation rate. And that's continued this year in 2018-19. Again, boys participating at 52.4% and girls at 47.6. And remembering that the overall gender distribution is fairly similar to that exact, um, those exact percentages. Of note, though, if you look at the bottom of the page, and I'll scroll down just so we can see it, um, something that's not captured in, in the athletics data but is, is worth noting um, are those students who are participating in drill, cheer, cheer stuntmen, and unified athletics. Those are not included in the numbers above for athletic participation. And so if you take the um, 33, and they, they are all girls right now participating in drill, 35 girls in cheerleading, um, and so you add those 68 students into that total of um, 532, you can see that we're even getting um, uh, a much closer in terms of almost direct comparison between boys and girls. We added in as well unified sports this year, which we have not had necessarily um, highlighted, but they've come to board meetings and we've recognized them um, just to show that we have 16 uh, athletes this year and 38 partner uh, uh, participants as well who have participated in unified sports this year as well. Can I ask Director a question Drinkwater. about that? Yes. Um, so that number seemed a little high to me since I'm familiar with this program. Yes. And I noticed down in the narrative it said um, how many participated in robotics, which is considered a unified sport, I get that, um, and basketball and soccer. But I think they were. I think they're duplicated yeah, counts is what I received or from the counted. athletic department on yeah. that one. And so yeah, they, are. they are duplicated counts on okay. that one for that one, yes. Yeah, and but the other ones they're non on the rest of the report, there. they're not because things add up to 100%, Correct. right? Okay. Yeah. Just want to make sure. I wasn't sure if that was intentional. Or just want to make sure as we go over time that that's repeated so that it's. Got it. Or I can back them out and and amend the data right. too. So as way. we build the data, we yep. just want to make sure we're consistent with Absolutely. how we count them. Okay. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. When we look at discipline data, again, we're looking at proportionality. Um, and 1.0 would be our ideal, although 0.0, .0 would be very ideal um, if we had no discipline. And so um, if you recall, last year there were some unique situations that occurred at the high school which caused um, some of our numbers to spike. So um, one or two very significant incidences uh, had the ability to change our numbers. Um, and so, and this would also represent the same student who may have been in trouble once or more than one time. Um, and so it is duplicated in the proportionality. Um, overall, we, we don't have a ton of discipline, major discipline issues. Um, we had fewer than 10 in-school suspensions, um, and so we didn't report on those, but the out-of-school suspensions and exclusions or um, expulsions were, we had several of those last year, if you recall. All right, I'm gonna move to the EES. Um, in the EES survey, uh, a number of our categories either remained the same or had a slight uptick. The one unusual um, piece that popped out to us that's gonna definitely require some more investigation at the student level is both our staff and parents indicated um, a positive increase in indicating we provide diverse materials, curriculum that reflects the diversity of our community and also um, that perceptions of how parents feel our schools celebrate different cultures improved by 13%. So both of those had a significant jump. And yet when you look at our student perspective, the students actually declined. Um, and so trying to figure out, we've done at all building levels, we've done a lot of professional development around diversity and uh, equity. And so we've, we've hit the adult piece enough to see that there is an uptick in the positive responses they're feeling, the parent community is feeling like we're, we're making some great strides. 
and yet our students aren't seeing that reflected in their perceptual data. And so we want to make sure that we get to the student piece and go back and figure out what is it from a student perspective that we're missing. So we're, we're doing a great job hitting the adults, but where it really counts is in the classroom and two of the students were in our hallways and schools. And so um, that's definitely going to be an action step for us is to figure out how we bring this to the student level. Any questions on the quantitative overall? Any sections of it or different parts before we move to the school teams? Let's see. Appreciate the report. Um, just a, I guess a call, a call out is uh, uh, very much appreciate the no-cut sports. I know, uh, you know, they, which really increase and promote inclusivity. Um, you know, I fully recognize that sometimes the resources, circumstances, as well as participation numbers require some sports to be cut, but, you know, truly the no-cut sports, that's great. And uh, I'm not familiar recently with it, but IMS just has a wonderful cross-country program that's an extremely inclusive and positive experience for those athletes. Um, I was watching the video of our when we were reviewing the language like we're gonna do two weeks from now on this one, and we had a discussion about this exact two questions uh, that you addressed, which was um, uh, like the percentage of parents who agree, quote, this school has activities to celebrate different cultures, including mine. And this is something that the board discussed, and it was when you have a monoculture or a dominant culture, and you're asking for a percentage of people who are agreeing to that, it could hide um, negative um, feelings just by saying, hey, 80% of the majority feel, feel uh, appreciated. Where, and so the, the, I guess where we discussed was, was it possible to aggregate this data down to perhaps the, the, the races to see if, um, this, this percentage is across the board or if there's actually some differences there? So in the current survey, which closes a week from tomorrow, so anyone following ho at home, please feel, feel free to <laughs> fill out the EES survey. Um, that this is the first year where we're asking parents demographic information on the front end. So yes, starting with the, cur with the data that we receive in a month from now, we'll be able to do that for the parents. <coughs> Up until now, parents were never asked to reveal demographics going into the survey, so we couldn't get that data. So this will be the first year coming up where we can. Thank yeah. You. And just a follow-on question would be, I appreciate that, is, is with the students, I guess the question is, can you disaggregate that data? And then I guess the other question would be, there is a slight phrasing difference between that parent question and that student question where um, the parent question has that phrase and ends including mine and the student one doesn't have that phrase and I was wondering if um, EES has an explanation for that or, or not or why it's slightly different. So I think that's a great point, uh, Director Jorgensen. I think what we should do is go back and make sure we didn't transpose it incorrectly onto here when we did the cut and paste, or whether or not the actual question reflects that as well. So we'll go back and look at that, um, absolutely. And then it, with respect to the student component, um, we do ask the students on those, and so that is something that we could get access to in terms of what the student piece is, and happy to look at that. All right, let's turn it over to our school teams uh, to take a look and, and hear some of the qualitative uh, experiences taking place in the schools. Sure. Hello. So, hi. All right. Is this, is this on? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, for the opportunity to um, speak to you a little bit tonight about our work around um, Fundamental 7, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. I know I speak for all of my colleagues at the elementary levels, and I imagine for all levels here tonight, when I say that the intent and goals um, captured by this fundamental, fundamental really speak to our why, the reason we come to work every day, and our reason for doing what we do. 
because it is at the end of the day about seeing, supporting, and recognizing and celebrating every individual student while we also move our entire system and our school communities forward. So thanks again for your support in this work. So tonight, Amy and I are going to share with you, um, on behalf of all four elementaries, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the diversity theme and Amy's going to dial in on our work around PBIS. Regarding the diversity theme in all of our elementary school, the bulk of our efforts this year um, have really been to unify and systemize across all four buildings. This is a key element in all of our school improvement plans and we've worked very closely together to maximize our resources and to expand our diversity focus um, to include more fully the work around equity and inclusion. So <clears throat> tonight, I hope you'll hear that we're working collaboratively to ensure that every student in our district is guaranteed an equitable and inclusive education regardless of the building where they land. So some of our collective efforts across all the buildings, we've done a lot of work with professional learning and professional development. We've continued staff development, building off past years' work with Ben Abali and Dr. Caprice Hollins and then uh, Dr. Lisa, Lisa Hoyt with the PBIS. We've con we're, we have future plans to work with Dr. Lisa Hoyt around PBIS, um, Cassie Martin around inclusive schools and practices, and some of our work with Scotty Nash and the Danielson framework, uh, specifically around the work that OSBEI has been doing with all of the um, frameworks to identify and define racially equitable practices in our schools. Um, there's some site-specific book studies going on um, around the inclusive education checklist and what if I say the wrong things, um, 25 habits for culturally effective people. Um, we have co-teaching training and opportunities in different places around the district and that's re really about pushing in special program services more of the time in collaboration with the generation, our generation the general ed teacher and the special education teachers in the gen ed classroom, so it's an inclusive practice. We have we've continued with GLAD training to address growing numbers of ELL students across all our buildings. Um, we have uh, professional learning around PBIS, mindfulness, inclusive classroom, instruction and management, management practices. Um, for all staff, and we've really stepped up, uh, including our classified staff as well, in those trainings. And then we have several site-specific cultural and um, cultural enrichments, really. Um, purposeful and intentional efforts to build classroom and school libraries that reflect our local and global societies, um, including literature that addresses social, social justice, citizens with differing abilities, women's rights, equal rights, and, and more, um, but in age-appropriate ways, which is one of our challenges at the elementary level. Is it's different teaching those issues to a kindergartner than a fifth grader. Um, we have presentations and performances from um, groups such as Taproot and Book at Theater companies. They present stories to help students understand and empathize with people from diverse experiences and, and deal with diverse challenges. We have artists and resident, residents and special guests from every country imaginal, imaginable, cultures and different races. Um, each of us has some form of an international night and set ancestry projects, cultural celebrations throughout the year. And then we also have um, worked on purchasing and adopting foreign language type materials and technologies that assist our students with over a dozen languages in our elementaries. Good evening. Um, so I've been tasked with sharing a little bit more about our PBIS systems, and PBIS stands for Positive Behavior Intervention and Supports. It sounds like a, a small thing, but as most systems are, it's got lots of moving parts in, in, in the bigger system that it is. So each of us are at um, different stages in developing and making our PBIS systems more <coughs> robust at, at all of our buildings. Um, but what we're working towards with our PBIS system is making sure that each of our schools are explicitly teaching and reinforcing those expected behaviors for our classrooms. I think sometimes we assume that um, kids kind of know how to behave without being explicitly taught and, and the focus can be more on the academics. But what we know is that that is not the case and so we need to make sure we take the time to teach all of our learners what are the expected pro-social behaviors that will lead to their success and then we um, work to reinforce, model, reteach, reinforce and so on. Um, 
Our goal with this program is to really create respectful and inclusive environments for all of our students who walk through our doors. And so um, as part of that program, each school has different ways that they recognize kids who are um, showing those expected behaviors, um, some form of token. At Northwood, we call them soaring owl cards. They're pause cards at West, pride at Lake Ridge, and soar cards at um, Island Park. And these are just ways to engage kids and recognize and point out, gosh, that was a really uh, respectful thing you just did, and name it and, and celebrate it, and thereby encouraging more of that behavior. Um, we all, all of the schools also have regular lunches where we celebrate and recognize students who have been um, soaring in our case or, or developing pride. So they're showing us that they're making those good choices on a regular basis and we want to acknowledge and encourage that in our students. Um, we also have a number of various other ways throughout the schools that we do that, sometimes through morning announcements or lunchtime announcements. Um, through displays in the hallways, lots of different ways to really bring attention to the positive things that our kids are doing and, and to encourage them through those. Um, one example um, that's very fresh in my mind because we did it today, we have a monthly um, Soaring Owls assembly that's hosted each month by a different grade level. So today our first graders um, informed us that in the month of um, March, our students earned about 2,200 Soaring Owl cards for all their good choices. And they also taught us about resilience and what we can do to foster that in ourselves. Um, we learned a really great song called Bounce Back. Let me know if you're interested in hearing that one. Um, sing it, sing it, sing it. Yes, we're interested. Sing it. No, no, that is not what I meant. I can provide you the link. Um, as part of our system, because it is something that, that has a lot of moving parts um, as uh, Heidi mentioned we've been working with a consultant, Dr. Lisa Hoyt, and one of the things she's doing with all of our schools, um, elementary all the way up through high school, is what's called a tiered fidelity inventory. Because PBIS is part of that multi-tiered system of support that is one of our focus areas over the next three-year plan, um, we want to take a look at each tier and make sure that we're monitoring how well are we doing, where are our areas for improvement, what are our next steps, and then we're making action plans at each building so that we can move our work forward and improve our systems for the benefit of our kids. I think I'm next. Good evening, thanks for having uh, us tonight. I'm here representing my, my peers in the back there. We s <laughs> there weren't enough chairs. Um, yeah. So I'm gonna, <laughs> that's, that's what they told me. Yeah. I'm going to talk about tonight about just give you an update of the IMS diversity and equity team, sort of the, where we're working on now. Fred, it's on the bottom of page 10. Uh, we, this is our, our, depending on if you start with year zero when we really started talking about this um, goal or initiative, it's, it's our fourth or fifth year, and we've really gone through lots of learning professionally as a, as a group um, about diversity and equity and what it means for our kids in our school. Um, some of the highlights just that's happening recently this year is we uh, have added a student member to our team, which is great to get the student voice because um, we adults can, can see things from one <coughs> lens, but it's also great to have that, that student lens as well. One of the things we're really, really focusing on is uh, if you go on any district website, including our own, uh, or any school website, there's always going to be a some sort of commitment to diversity and equity. But very rarely when you dig deeper does it talk about what that means for kids. And so we're really focusing on what does, we're focusing on developing goals and figuring out what does that goal mean for a sixth grade student or for a seventh grade or for an eighth grade student. So we have a progression of learning from when the kids enter from fifth grade all the way to when they leave and go up to ninth grade of what does it mean, what are the goals and objectives for kids in certain areas of, of diversity and equity. And that can be starting at the beginning from what is, what are components of diversity and equity? So what do you need to teach a sixth grader in terms of that? What's developmentally appropriate? seventh grade and eighth grade, just like one of my elementary colleagues said, it's a lot different when you need to teach something to a kindergartner than a fifth grader. Well, same thing from a sixth grader to an eighth grader. When we talk about what are bias, what's an intrinsic bias I might have, um, what does that mean for a sixth grader? So really developing those granular objectives 
And so we can develop our classroom lessons, make sure our materials match, uh, our curriculum matches to really be able to measure are we giving kids a, an appropriate progression from sixth to eighth grade? We also uh, are thinking about, uh, our student representatives really talked about the, the recent issues around religious diversity and how we appropriately deal with that in school. So we're expanding um, from our diversity and com equity committees, expanding some of the topics we talked about and really figuring out once again, where is a sixth grader? What do they need to know in terms of that? And so really focusing back on the students and developing that. Now we're just starting the work with that to really deal with grade levels, but that's our work this year and we're really excited about it. It's gonna take a while. It's nothing that um, it's gonna come overnight and there's very few models of what it might look like. Like I said, there's models about what districts will do or what schools will do, but not breaking it down. They don't have a common core for diversity objectives. And so we're really looking into that. So we're excited about our work, but um, it's gonna take a while, but we think it's the right way to go. Yeah, that's, uh, that's very exciting. Do you, do you have curriculum around that or are you developing the curriculum too? Well, one of the things we had done in, in our diversity committee in, in the past couple of years is looked at our curriculum and decided does it match with, does it give uh, protagonists from um, different ethnic, ethnicities, races, genders. Um, so we, we will need to relook at that, but it's past work that we've done. And once we have those objectives and have the, the skeleton, then we need to make sure we add those pieces to make sure yeah. um, we're still in line with where we wanna go. And uh, you define diversity broadly as well, I assume, not just racial. Correct, correct. And especially with the, the most recent um, uh, community issues, we, we've heightened our sense of, of needing to do, to do that. Thank you, that's, that's great. Thanks. Good evening. I'm gonna talk about our margins program, which we're very happy um, to have gotten off the ground this year. It's the first year program of margins. Um, and we use the definition marginalization is the process of pushing a particular group or groups of people to the edge of society by not allowing them an active voice, identity, or place in it. And, and we use that definition to, that describes who we're gonna work with. And so it is a five month program and we're past the halfway point. Uh, we're about a week away from going down to Los Angeles. But we front loaded a lot of work. Um, we started with looking at our, our identity where all the students were you know, really looking inside and inside themselves and who are they? It beyond just what you see, but sort of those roots. So not just the leaves and the branches, but really what's the roots. Um, and then we introduced, um, it's a protocol or it's a way to look at different situations. Um, it's called frame, using your frame, where the F is facts, gathering all the facts. The R is the reality. Whose reality is it? Is it yours or is it the persons you're, you're looking at? The A is assumptions, challenging your assumptions or challenging uh, another person's assumptions. The M is maintain an open mind and the E is expand your exposure. So we've been working with our students as a way to look at different situations, to look at different issues and even when they're having conversations with people um, around whatever they're gonna talk about. Um, then we moved on to the cycle of socialization. We went on to talk about gender roles. We watched the film, The Mask You Live In, to talk about masculinity and, and how those gender roles play a part in with our young males. Uh, we talked about the U.S. Declaration of Human Rights, social class, economic justice, and these are weekly lessons. We've been meeting weekly since January. Um, then we got into the meat of our trip is around mass incarceration and really looking at the effects of that and how it's destroyed communities and how drugs, the war on drugs is different this time uh, from crack cocaine which was a lock them up and destroy communities and families to the opioid which is about um, treatment keeping families together, two ways to um, deal with an epidemic but really cause mass incarceration. Uh, we looked at immigration 
and the undocumented, the plight of the undocumented and, and their ability to, um, to work to become documented and, and just the struggles that they go through and what is an undocumented um, citizen? Because as we know, it's not just everyone coming across the border, um, it's people who overstay visas that they are now undocumented. Then we moved on to the homeless and the faces of homelessness. And so those are the lessons that we've done to move us up to the point where we are. And now we're doing deep dive into the eight community partners that we're going to see. We're gonna see two for the criminal justice, Homeboy Industries that works with ex-gay members getting out of prison to ARC, Anti-Recidivism Coalition, that they do policy work. Um, we are going to work for our homeless Crete Academy, which is in South Central Los Angeles, second year of a homeless a school, K through six, has 200 families. We're gonna do a Guadalupe Homeless Project, where we're going to cook a meal for 65 homeless residents. Um, Impacto, which is an organization that deals with young people 18 to 24, who have mental health challenges, and so they find them housing. One of the biggest growing homeless populations in Los Angeles is community college students because their grants only cover books and tuition and they can't find housing near the campus. Then we're also going to, um, for immigration, we are going to look at the Children's Bureau. Um, that, it, that's an organization that works um, with families all ages but specializes in um, birth to five years old. And so we, ha we have this amazing opportunity. Our students are well prepared to go down there. Um, and, and we're gonna go down there and we're gonna do this work. We're gonna get our hands dirty. And then when we come back, we're still, the program's not over. Then that's where we prepare for our action projects. And that's the meat of the program. It's, it was the learning up into the trip. The trip was to really see it and now bring it back to Mercer Island and the greater community and what they can do there. And we already have students who say, I want to talk to lawmakers about homelessness. And um, so at the end of May and June, you will receive an invite to our action plans presentations where students will be presenting their action plans. And um, it, it's a very exciting time for these students. And Puckett said before coming down, she talked to a student that's very excited. And so we're really looking at expanding this program to go to a nev another site next year. And I'm also looking at how can I take some of these lessons that we've done there and push them through bridges so that our whole student body gets some of the things that we just talked about. So that's a little bit about our margins program and I wanna thank you for giving it your blessing um, several months ago. That's, uh, that's pretty amazing. That's, uh, <laughs> uh, that's Wow, I'm, I'm blown away that you're fitting all that in. <laughs> yeah. uh, out of curiosity, how, how is it funded uh, for the program? So I'm responsible for that part of it. Um, we went out to the community and you know, people's pockets are dry right now. Um, and I think because the program is brand new, people are trying to get their heads around what is that really. Um, so we actually had uh, a group of students step up and they said we want to use our club support to financially support this project. I was blown away by that. That's telling me something, that's telling us something about our students, our students saying we need this, we need to support something like this. So our students stepped up this year, um, are their peers to support this. Also the students that are going, they are, you know, there's, there's some skin in the game for them too. They have to come up with some finances. Some of them don't have the same financial support. It, it different, there's diversity in our financial support within the students that are going as well. And so um, I, I was really, really proud of our students um, 
groups that stepped up to support their peers to say, we want to help support that through the club support that we have in our, our funds in our clubs. And so we have a couple groups that are that are helping to support that. We're hoping through the spring gala event, as I, I don't know, gala might be kind of a strong word to use for it, but um, an event that we're hoping that through that people can see that the work that we're doing is not just yakety yakety yak at them. It, it's actually getting them into the work and feeling it and understanding how the world operates with equity and diversity and how, or how it doesn't operate very well. And so with getting their hands um, dirty on this, they're not gonna be staying in the Hyatt Regency. They're gonna be staying and they're gonna be cooking their own meals and. We'll see how that goes, right? <laughs> I'm, gl I'm glad I'm not cooking the meals because um, they would not do well with that. But um, so it's well, it really is, yeah. It's it, that's really the cool thing right now is we've got student support right now. And um, two of the students who are going um, out, they're yeah, they're filming it and they're gonna do they're gonna wow. tape and film so. When we come back and for next year for our fundraising, uh, we will have video of our own students mm -hmm. doing the work and we won't have to yeah. use other students. I do want to emphasize that the project, the, the big piece of it is they're coming back and they have to make a difference in their community. They can't just yada, yada, yada. They got to do something with that. And so they're already brainstorming and thinking about what projects they really want to do. And we hope to see that this expands so that we have lots of students that are interested in it. Um, I know our two school board rep members, our student reps, they're like, wow, we would have liked to have been in the middle of that too. And so, mm -hmm. um, so we, we're hoping that we'll get more student interest and community support um, because I think that through the work that they've, kids growing up through our school system, my, uh, my hope is that by the time they get to high school, we're gonna be able to put them to work actually making a big difference physically. Um, thank you for this program. I, it sounds like a perfect mix of um, education and actual life experience. Um, I'm just wondering if the students have an opportunity to participate with the, our more local organizations. Um, obviously, I can see benefits to traveling together and learning and being immersed in it, but um, we have lots of those here mm -hmm. um, in the state, and so I'm just wondering if, I, I assume their action plans are gonna be here, so it, how much it, do they know about the local Exactly, and so that's when we come back, that's where we'll bring it now, tie it to the local initiatives and the local issues here. Um, that's one reason, you know, we just went across the, the, uh, the lake for our retreat to Douglas Truth, and I'm from that area, but it's just 10 minutes away, but they were able to start seeing tents tent cities and things like that. So when they come back, they will be partnering with um, available or um, different local organizations. The one young lady who's interested in homelessness, as I've already um, put her in touch with the Orion Center down there in Denny that deals with homeless students. And so they will be working, bringing it back here and trying to reach out. Some will start clubs at the school social justice type clubs and others will find other initiatives again that are local and that's that's where we get the the big bang for our buck that's where it starts to spread when they come back and do the work here i i want to note that we are seeing an increase of students who are going homeless at the secondary level and it's happening here on mercer island um and so uh, some of our students are recognizing that and wanting to start to go, what are we going to do to help our peers um, in school right now that are homeless? And so we're, it, it, it truly is not just Seattle area or around us, it's, it's Mercer Island. And um, I think that that's, for some students, that's a new thing for them to figure that out. So, yeah. Thank you very much. This is this is an amazing program. I also super appreciate the value of making it extra special and pulling extra kids in by taking the trip to Los Angeles and really immersing yourself into it. And this is this is the sort of thing that uh, will create amazing leaders in the future. And the awareness of what's happening around them, Mercer Island, Seattle, wherever, will just uh, increase tremendously. So I'm, I'm super touched by um, what you're doing.
And, and that's the goal is to really change some lives um, from that experience that they're going to have down there in, in another week or so. Any final thoughts? Um, no, I think it's, uh, I would, you know, it's, it's been a journey uh, since we started to really make this a priority in our school district to pay greater attention to um, what we originally started off with as, you know, a diversity initiative and then really dissecting that and really thinking that it's not about the diversity, it's about, you know, the experience of students, of staff, of community. Um, and so I know when Superintendent Koloski joined the school district, um, we made an intentional shift to start talking about equity and inclusion and that, you know, the diversity is going to be here um, based on who moves here, but it's what you, it's the conversations you're having about curriculum as, as Aaron was talking about or um, extracurricular clubs or how do we involve different students. So. Um, we are certainly not there. We, we have some good markers that are helping us to indicate that we're making some progress. We've got others that say we need to continue to make some strides, but um, I know these educators here at this table tonight and all of the teachers um, in their buildings and support staff and bus drivers um, are trying to really make an effort to make it, a, make it a place for all students here on Mercer Island. So I just want to thank the school teams because I know it's a lot of work just want to give our students an opportunity to make any comments or ask questions. Yeah, I actually did want to say one thing. Um, a lot of you have been mentioning, especially Mr. Miller, said that um, a student was added to the I IMS diversity team. Um, I might be a little biased because I'm sitting here, but I don't think that student voice can be overestimated in its importance. Um, I love that there's so many adults working on this, and like obviously you're all doing great work. <laughs> but um, I, I think that student voice is going to be really important in ensuring that all students feel welcome. And it's hard to know what students think unless you're getting dra like a direct perspective from one of them. So thank you for that. <laughs> I would just like to um, remind the board, and I think it's something to note that we certainly monitor and, and measure this work. but. Um, there's not an end. This is ever, ever evolving and ever ongoing because um, the students change who come through our, into our classrooms and into our schools every year. So in measuring and monitoring it, we're certainly keeping it at the forefront, but it is that reminder of this work has to be embraced and embedded in everything we do um, throughout all of our work. And thank you to this awesome team. You guys are a plus. So um, just want to say an appreciation to the administration, to the school sites, to the teachers for performing this Fundamental 7 work. Um, it's important. It looks really difficult at times. It's needed in our community. It's needed in our nation. So thank you. Um, really impressive qualitative report. I, I appreciated the IMS where I'm from poem aspect of it. So um, just uh, I think it would be appropriate to give a call out to our former superintendent, Dr. Plano, who kind of spearheaded this four or five years ago. Um, it's, it's wonderful to see where it's grown. Um, appreciation to our board members that have served on the diversity committee and done that hard work and appreciation to our superintendent for continuing it. So thank you all. Um, you know, we're trying demographics, both the economic and the racial are not really representative of Washington state or our nation. And to the extent that we have underrepresented communities, our students kind of without your work are at risk for not fully appreciating these cultures and communities. So super important. Um, I just, I, I did want to mention one thing. Um, in the intro on page 10, uh, on the third paragraph, um, it talks about the, the new SEAC, Superintendent's Equity Advisory Committee. And 
the last sentence in the third paragraph says this this committee is closely considering the board's draft revisions to vision mission and values as this committee reimagines its purpose and um, you know this, the, the mission vision and values we did a lot of work on but we also condensed it it's very small and I hope that that committee really also looks at fundamental seven and the, the greater work that you, you, you've presented today as well as past years as the goal to also impact its purpose as well. I'm ready to make a motion if there's no other comment. I'd uh, actually just really quickly like to echo uh, the comment around uh, mission vision uh, does narrow it down a little bit, and I'd hate to lose the value that <laughs> the, uh, has really been demonstrated over here. When we first stood it, started the Diversity Advisory Committee, um, I, I don't think we even envisioned this, uh, this level of work being done throughout the school system and the work that has gone into the curriculum and the depth of these programs. So it's, uh, it's pretty amazing to, to see it all happen and be highlighted like this. So uh, I hope we don't uh, narrow it down too much with, from our mission and vision conciseness. <laughs> I think the goal of um, that statement is there, is there has been some turnover in membership on the, on the team. So it's really to realign our work, to realign it um, in the equity way and um, really addressing, as um, Mr. Miller pointed out, the impact on students as a school system, how are we making sure, and we noted that in some of our statements that we're seeing the shift in adults thinking, um, but not so much in students. So the that group working to see how do we get this to um, really have that impact on students. They did participate in the thought exchange. <laughs> Thank you. I was just going to say that, um, you know, through our work with the values, mission, vision, um, the way I see it is it's not, not diluting it or making it more condensed. It's who we are now. I mean, it's who we are as a district. These programs um, that you all work tirelessly on are embedded in our schools, in our curriculum, um, and we see it. Um, as parents um, with our kids practicing these things outside of school. So um, I, the way that I interpret it at this point is, is fundamental seven and our m matches up with our mission and vision and values and that that's now the core of what we focus on. Obviously we're educational sites, um, but you know, we're no longer the three R's. So um, in a really positive way. So. Again, thank you for all of your work, um, and it's still my favorite report of the year, so <laughs> I <laughs> look forward to more of them, and I'll um, defer to Tracy for a motion. I move that we find the school district in compliance with the full monitoring of Fundamental 7. I second. Any discussion? All, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. I just would like to make one comment and I just want to say thank you for supporting all of us and particularly Megan and Caroline, you guys rocked it tonight <laughs> as a student reps. I was so proud to see you in the audience and your peers to be able to see you do the board report. So thank you very much. Um, thank you. Thank you. So it's now 6.15. Um, and I'm just going to kind of get a gauge if we want to take a very short break, a five minute. How about we do a five minute? Do you want to see if there's any public input well, that since it's after six? and um, There's none. There's no public input at this time. Okay, okay so I'll leave. So why don't we um, take a brief recess, five minutes. We'll come back at 620. And if anyone from the public does would like to present at public input, now is the time to take care of that.
All right, it is 623, gonna call the meeting back to order. Um, and I will just check again, make sure, see if we have any public input. We do not, so we will move on to our superintendent report. So just a few quick things to update the board with. Um, first of all, I um, wanna let the board know that our food services contract expires at the end of this school year on June 30th and district staff is currently working with OSPI. There's lots of regulations to do with our food service program to prepare the RFP and with OSPI approval should be able to publish in early April. The process then will be for potential candidates to um, come visit, et cetera, during April with a timeline of being a decision of a selected company for the board's approval at our May 9th meeting. Um, this week, our superintendent teaching and learning advisory met and that superintendent advisory participated in the thought exchange for the values, vision, and mission statement. Our student advisory has also participated. There are 15 more focus groups, including staff, students, parents, and community that will be um, asked to participate in. So we're starting to get some interesting data and input as the different groups are, are meeting. Um, also for the, I think we've sent you this information, but I wanna remind the board that Dr. Sunaya Luthar, who's the executive director of Authentic Connections, and I believe she's out of Arizona State, she will be visiting Mercer Island on April 16th and 17th. Our MIHS students took the High Achieving School Survey, the HAAS, earlier in March, and the survey was developed by Dr. Luther and has been used across the country with school communities that resemble Mercer Island. So Dr. Luther will be here on the 16th for Community and Parent Forum at 6 p.m. to 7.30 in the high school pack. So I hope that you um, will be able to attend that. And then on the 17th, she will be working with staff, MIHS staff early in the morning, and then a district um, and MIYFS leaders at from later in the morning and then with students after that. So this has been a great partnership with our um, MIYFS colleagues who um, have worked with us through this survey, and Dr. Luther did do some work on Mercer Island about 10 years ago, so um, it's kind of a cycle back for her. And just a reminder that because of spring break, our next regular meeting is next week. It is on the fourth. We're not going a two week cycle because the following week is spring break. So we'll see our student reps back in a week. <laughs> and that's all I have for now. Thank you. Um, we will move on then to uh, section four, partial governance process monitoring. And I will defer to Mr. Rundle. Dr. Rundle, sorry. Fred is fine. Or Fred. <laughs> Excited tonight to bring forth uh, two world language uh, adoptions uh, for your considerations. This is a first reading. Uh, the next reading would be, or the second reading um, and approval would be at your next uh, board meeting. So um, we have uh, three uh, that you're gonna see during the school year. So tonight you're not seeing Spanish. You'll see them in June. Um, they were spending more time uh, on their adoption, considering other options, and frankly, it's because they have a lot more to choose from uh, than French and Chinese. Um, so they, you will see that later on in June. Tonight, you're gonna see French, and we have uh, Dina Viat. Um, then we're also gonna see a Chinese um, recommendation from Zhou Su Hu, Hu um, who is here tonight as well. So just overview um, from a, uh, process perspective, uh, both uh, of these teacher leaders uh, were looking and working with not just the high school but also the middle school as they were considering options for texts. As we, uh, a quick reminder, 
our uh, middle school uh, under the current model, they kind of have a 1A and a 1B experience. So seventh grade is typically a 1A year and, and then there's the 1B year. So most students when they leave the middle school, if they've completed the 1A, 1B succession, then they go into a year two when they get to the high school. Some choose to do year one again as a freshman um, and that's really dependent upon the student. And so we're really thinking about how do we make that uh, transition from whatever experience they've had in, a, in middle school to the high school um, as seamless as possible. So tonight we have um, uh, the two adoptions here. I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Dina to start with the French adoption first. Um, and then we'll turn it over to Joe Su for the uh, Chinese adoption. They are separate, so we'll have to do um, separate presentations as well as separate voting in another week's time. So let me turn it over to you, Dina. Okay. Um, I'll pass the books to you because you can't really see them from here. Um, and so the, the Fren for French, we, um, whoops, we had, um, there, are about, there are about four different um, textbooks to choose from in French. Um, and um, I have taught out of one of them, which is the Vista Higher Learning, and um, it's really, um, f it was written for a freshman in college, and so it's really dense, and, um, and then they have um, lots of college vocabulary in there that doesn't really apply to high schoolers, and um, so I didn't feel it was appropriate for a middle school, um, and sometimes it's not even appropriate for freshmen. Um, and then, so then that left three others. Um, there's a brand new one that came out this year called Voices Digital. It's all digital and it is, um, um, I like it, um, but when we, um, we did um, from Voices Digital, we also had um, Te Branche, which you're looking at, and then BND, those are the three choices. And um, when we sat down um, with the middle school teacher and myself and the other French teacher and we filled out all the actful rubrics um, for textbook adoption, um, Voices Digital really came through as more of a supplement um, than a, a series that you would adopt. It didn't have enough um, resources and things like that. Um, and so then it kind of came down to BND and Te Branche, and we um, had reps come in and present to us and um, analyzed them very carefully um, with uh, myself and the other two French teachers. And um, really what it came down to, they're both okay, um, but Te Branche is just much better because it's coming out with a 2019 version in the fall, um, and it's all, it's digital, it's all digital. The only, the hardbacks that you're looking at will just be backups in the classroom um, if somebody forgets their iPad. But basically they'll open up, they would open up a page and um, everything's clickable, and so they can hear everything, and um, when you go over vocab with them, um, they click the top and it turns into a Quizlet set, which you know I spent countless hours of my life making the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Quizlet sets that I've made, and um, there I just come with the book now. Um, it also comes with, every time a grammar concept is in introduced, it comes with grammar videos <laughs> that they can watch, which I spent also spent countless hours putting on my website um, in case someone's absent or they want to, you know, or they're absent, they're in class, but they're thinking of other things and they don't listen or something. I tell them that, like, you can be absent in class, it happens, like, click on the grammar video, rewatch it, you know. Um, this book, of course, comes with those. <laughs> Everything's done, um, and it came with uh, kind of like as uh, the high school teacher and the middle school teacher, and we all sat down and said, "What is? What do you really want from a series?" I said I really wanted um, something called IPAs, which are uh, inter um, integrated performance assessments, which is really the new um, kind of theory and methodology in language teaching. Um, it means that you're really um, assessing peop um, your students on their proficiencies and their performance in the language, rather than like here's a vocab set. Let's see how you do on memorizing it. Here's a, good, a grammar, let's see how you do on memorizing it. You're really, now you're just looking at them as a whole child and you're saying, can you read, write, speak, listen? And that's what you're graded on. And so um, a lot of the IPAs I've been writing or finding online for years now, Caroline has taken many of them. And um, um, this book obviously comes with them and comes with many versions of different IPAs and things like that. Um, one weakness of the book is it didn't come with the listening IPAs. Like I said, I've been writing them for many years now, so um, I can write, you go through about six chapters in a year and I'll write six IPAs, it's fine. That's how I'll overcome that. Um, we did tell the book publisher, you know, why, why don't we have listening IPAs? They didn't have a very good response for that. 
Um, but we feel like um, it comes with so many other positives. Um, for example, um, the thing that um, Madam Friedman was really adamant about is they had that they had a lot of gap activities, so like this, the scaffolding for the speaking. Um, we create a lot of that as well right now. And um, this book comes with all of, like, def like per chapter you've got like 10 activities like this and you couldn't possibly use them all. It has more resources than we can possibly use. So we're really happy with this and we think it's going to be um, really good for moving um, the, the language program forward into like the modern way of teaching and things like that, the reading, writing, speaking, listening and all that. Um, can you go into more depth on that, on the, the four elements of fluency? Yes. Um, so really, um, when, you when you're teaching language, um, you're really, you know, you do little mini grammar because um, as you do, gra but, but it's really taken a back seat to the four proficiencies of just like going over a little bit of grammar, but then having them read and listen and get the input and then write and speak as the output to it. Their output can only follow um, the amount of input. So you have to continue with a lot of input and it builds at their level. And then you go over mini grammars because once you've go gone over a grammar, you don't want to focus on it because they have to practice. But once you've go gone over a grammar, then it's in their framework, in their brain for comprehensible input when they read and listen next time. And so then they can actually, instead of it just washing over them and them getting the gist of what they're listening to or reading, then when they've had the grammar, um, then it's going to stick because it, 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 they can build the framework of it because they they it was explained to them. So it is necessary to do a little bit of grammar, but we really, it takes a back seat now to the, to the inputs, more input, more input. So we do a lot more reading, a lot more listening so that we can get the output that we want, which is why we see if you walk into th uh, even a third year class um, in, in the, our language classes, they're, they're speaking fluently. Um, and so the methodology has changed very drastically in like the last 10 years. And so we're trying to make sure our language department is right up there with everybody with all of this. And these, this series comes with um, pre-AP listenings and readings for every single level, level appropriate. So I think it's a good series. Dina was saying when we were meeting, kind of doing final overviews of them, I, you know, what am I going to do with all this time that I'm going to have now that I'm <laughs> not building the everything. curriculum? And I said, well, now the beauty is you actually get to think about how you're going to teach it rather than what you're going to teach. So um, it really, I think, opens up an opportunity for our language teachers to focus less on what do I have to develop of the what, but how am I going to meet my students' needs? And I think that's really exciting. It, it is really exciting. Well. Um, I, uh, when I got here six years ago, I was like, oh, <laughs> The word Walkman is in my <laughs> first year book. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> and the kids will be like, what's a Walkman? I'm like, oh, <laughs> let, me, let me tell you what that is. It's, let's, let's talk about typewriters at the same time. <laughs> um, so it's quite you know, humorous or whatever. And we've worked around it because there's, there's so many resources online now. You can just, I mean, I go on, you go onto the French teacher's Facebook page and they've got a Google Drive that has a lifetime worth of resources in it. Um, so you just search what you want and find good sources and put it together into um, good units and things like that. But um, the danger is if you get like a brand new teacher into the middle school because Jan Brousseau is retiring that, that doesn't know about all, all the resources online and doesn't have the, the 20 years of experience to create curriculum, then what she's going to need good resources um, to, to have a, a very a viable program. And so it kind of became a little bit more urgent this year that I thought Jan was retiring and things like that, so. Questions for Dina? Th that's, uh, that's impressive. Have, uh, have we looked at any s uh, other districts that have used the books at all? So I'm on the, um, I'm on the Facebook page for this book now, Table Hanche, and so I've asked a lot of questions. And um, interestingly, because it's a 2019 version coming out, um, not a, not a lot of the people online have the new online version of it. They all are using the old just like book, workbook kind of thing. Um, but um, it was interesting. I, I put out the question on the Facebook page uh, last week about, have you guys used the IPAs? What do you think of, of their IPAs, et cetera? Um, and <laughs> everybody's like, there's IPAs? <laughs> <laughs> so they didn't know. Um, so it's interesting because it's a 2019 version. It doesn't seem like their reps have been like selling it to the people already using it very much. So it'll be interesting to see. Um, I have not used this series, but Sabine Friedman used this at, um, what's the one in Redmond? 
Bush, no, not Bush. There's a private school, Overlake. So she used um, this series in Overlake and um, liked it a lot. So, yeah. Any other questions? No, this looks Megan. fantastic. I, I, I also okay. appreciate the file attachment that showed kind of the work and the, the yeah. committee members that yeah. mm -hmm. did that. It was nice. Uh, um, and as somebody who was in the school district 35 years ago and struggled for three years with French. And you're not fluent in French? Mm, Shocker. Uh, not so much. <laughs> um, but Caroline is, because she's in my class. There you go. Uh -huh. um, Caroline, tu parles français, toi. I'm really enthusiastic for the, yes. for the results. Yes. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, I too have been teaching a long time and they did not have these fluency levels like they do now um, since I've changed. I, s I learned about this methodology um, six years ago. I went to a Helena Curtin um, conference and I was like, ding, 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 so excited. Mm -hmm. um, and I just completely changed the way I teach. And um, it's been amazing. Mm -hmm. And I'm really trying to get everybody on board with it. Um, and a lot of the Spanish teachers are super, super excited, want to know a lot more about it. So I'm bringing in, I want to bring in with a grant, so we'll see if this works, um, an IPA teacher that was my inspiration. Um, like the teaches with this methodology, she's an expert in it, and now she's a consultant. And so we're hoping to get some professional development for the whole department. Um, it really makes a big difference. Yeah. Merci. Darian. Um, I think it's um, your face and demeanor says it all. <laughs> how great this will be for your for your craft. So thank you. Very it's going to be it's going to be so good for the for kids. Teachers, they yeah. they're they're such good kids. Mm -hmm. They're so fun to teach. So yeah. Okay. Um, oh, yes. Hi. Yes, please. Um, it's been on my mind because we just had the presentation about it, but I was wondering, yeah. um, like, the aspects of inclusivity and diversity, were mm -hmm. those part of the decision-making process? They are. Uh, we, have, um, we have, like, paper, we have paperwork um, that is in the book or something. Oh, that's right. It's around. We had, we, um, so two students, um, we had two students, Megan, Megana or Megan? Megana. Megana. No, I just said it wrong again. Megana. Megana. Yes. <laughs> I want to say it in the French way for some reason. It's weird. <laughs> um, strange. Uh, and so we had um, two students. We had the um, president and vice president of the French Honor Society analyze it and look for the diversity. So this paperwork may, um, has them, f uh, they, t they took about an hour and, and look through all the books. And what they're looking for is um, how are women represented in the textbook? Um, how, what jobs are the women doing? Mm -hmm. Um, are there um, people with disabilities? Are there people of color, um, et cetera, et cetera? And so they've looked through the whole book, and um, and it was approved by those two students, by a parent um, who I had come in, um, and by um, an instructional coach from the high school. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to say I've been in a lot of your classes. Um, I really, really appreciate this method of teaching. I feel like I've learned a lot from the four different disciplines. Um, yeah, I really appreciate it. And I also really love what Dr. Rundle was saying earlier about um, bridging the gap between middle and high school. Mm -hmm. um, I think that would be a really great improvement. So, bon travail, madame. Merci beaucoup. C'est gentil. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So, again, this will come back uh, as a second reading at your next meeting. And I'd like to now bring up Josu uh, to talk about uh, an adoption for Chinese. Um, we have, interestingly, uh, the Chinese adoption that we currently have at the high school is the EMC uh, publish, uh, publication, which is um, the French publication that you're seeing tonight. So we already have that at the high school for our Chinese teachers. Um, full transparency, we'll be upgrading to the um, latest online version next year so that our, our Chinese teachers have the same access to um, resources as uh, their French counterparts. And we'll see where the Spanish team ends up. But tonight is um, a quick look into um, an option that we'd like to now make available for the middle school. Um, and so Josu's here to talk about our um, Discovering Chinese Pro recommendation. So this year we started the process to adopt textbooks. Thank you. Um, and then personally, 
I own majority of the textbooks that is available on the market. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, but we don't have a lot of textbook for Chinese, especially for middle school and high school students. Majority of them is for high school, uh, for college student. Uh, so when we started the process, three of the Chinese teachers we meet together for three times. The first time we have a new Chinese teacher in middle school, so we brought bring her in in high school, and we talk about what is the difficulty you feel in middle school. If we are going to get a new textbook, what do you want in the textbook? So all three of us sit down and talking about the need in middle school, and most common problems is we feel the current textbook in high school has too much information in one unit. Or in other ways say is one theme covers too many materials. So it's really, really hard for middle school students to digest them in a fairly short time. And at the end of the seventh grade, <laughs> Uh, Chinese students who are taking, uh, students, middle school students who are taking Chinese, they go like, Spanish can talk about I like watermelon. French can talk about I watch a movie. But we are still in family members. Mm -hmm. I spent like two quarters uh, still learning the same thing. I'm not interested. So we really wanted to keep students interested in learning Chinese. So the textbook we are looking at, they have comic book format, if you look at it. Uh, and then each theme, they cut it into smaller contents. So it's spiral up. So seventh grade, they will cover 12 topics. The same topic will spiral up, yes, in eighth grade. And then when they move up to high school, it's actually the similar topic we will cover in Chinese one in high school. So. Uh, after we met, we talk about the needs for middle school, and then the second time we create a rubric to make a list of all the things we wanted for the workbook, uh, for the textbook. However, we don't have enough resources as French. I'm really jealous. Uh, so we just to say, do we have this? Do we have this? Do we have this? So if you look at the rubric we created, majority of the answers is no, 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 no. <laughs> so we still have a long way to go. Uh, but uh, however, all three of us, um, we sit down, we look at the textbook, we actually look at three series, and we look at different combinations. Like we continue to use Jin Bang, which is uh, in high school right now, or we use all of us change to Discover Pro, but we will cover volume one all the way to volume four. Or we will do middle school Discovery Pro and high school we continue to do Jin Bang series. And then after our long discussion, we decided to change the textbook in middle school and continue to use the same textbook in high school because it gives students um, to learn at different pace. Uh, another good thing about this textbook is they all digitally, everything is available uh, on their website. Uh, so students can listen to the dialogue, they can show the pinyin, uh, without pinyin, uh, pinyin and characters are only English, so there are multiple uh, different ways to use the textbook on their app. Uh, and also they provide more uh, exercise in listening, speaking, reading, and writing. So students will have a chance to practice, not only in classroom, but also at home. Uh, then uh, the parents who review the textbook actually ask a question. If I don't speak Chinese, how do I help my students? So this textbook actually solved the problem because uh, if you click on the words, it show up the pinyin. If you wanted to show the English meaning, it also show up the English meaning. So students, even though they don't have extra help from the parents, they can still continue to learn Chinese. Yeah, uh, I think that's it. Do you have any questions? <laughs> no, this, uh, this sounds great. Um, are anyone else, any other districts using this out of curiosity? Uh, uh, the same publisher, Bellevue School District use, is using a textbook from the same publisher. Uh, the publisher of, uh, the author of this book actually works for Beijing International School. So this book was tested in the field for more than 20 years. And they keep updating all the information to make it more student friendly. 
and now they kind of like wanted to sell it more to the mm. United States, so they have sales representatives in California. And then I, uh, one of our parent is actually work for that company. I see. Yeah. Oh, and the, uh, so really we're testing the iPad versions for the first time around here too, the yeah. digital content and yeah. things like that. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be very interesting because <laughs> we read articles about uh, these type of devices interfering with education as well. So it's going to be super, super interesting to see how kids like it and how it works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. I see, mm -hmm. right. Okay. But uh, we also provide hard copies in the classroom for students to use. Some of the students prefer hard copies over iPad. Yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm all in for digital, so I'm not complaining. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> I, 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 uh, I love the experiment, and I, I, I certainly hope it, uh, it makes acquiring language skills much easier. Uh, for that textbook, um, you can do the whole uh, assessment on the iPad too. They have a separate app just for assessment. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's Thank you. <laughs> As we um, look to bring it back to you for final recommendation, um, just on that, uh, kind of along that, that line of thinking, most, the industry standard is starting to go to basically a six year cycle on adoptions where you purchase, uh, you know, you get a package or a bundle of six year of online um, access and then you get the textbooks. And so we'll be looking to bundle those together. Um, it's starting to pose some challenges because costs aren't getting, aren't going down. Um, they continue to go up and then you're putting forward basically you're sinking a lot of costs into six years starting right away. So we're looking at a lot of different ways as a school district to try to save money there and also ex you know, um, use the resources appropriately. And um, uh, uh, Ty and I have had a lot of conversations with Andreeves about how we can be um, very prudent with how we make these purchases, but we're excited about the opportunity. EMC series, which is both the Chinese and the French, um, most of what they're presenting to us is on a Google Drive, and so anything, you know, like what I mentioned in the beginning where we had the word Walkman and things like that in that book, that, um, that current book with the high school, um, they, because everything's on a digital, on a digital format and, and on a Google Drive, um, they just update it when they need to, and so the materials don't actually um, expire like they, like they currently have. Um, and that was part of the selling point, I think, of the, and I, you know, it makes sense, so, um, yeah. But the physical textbook then would be out of sync with the uh, uh, electronic content. Um, I, I think, you know, you think just manage through that. I, yeah, I think, I think, you know, you could, you could, uh, yeah, uh, to a certain extent, but um, usually they, until they completely change versions, it's just like a vocab word or, or two. The language doesn't change, you know, yeah. so. The bigger issue is uh, the AP Comp Gov book that you adopted last year. That's one where we get the updates on the online version, but the textbooks, of course, will um, lag behind, uh, certainly as governments change. So I um, just want to publicly thank our two teacher leaders um, for all of their work in leading this process at the school site, um, bringing it through the IMC as well. I think both Josu and Dina were extremely committed to this all the way through and um, very diligent in their work. So thank you to both of you. Thank really you appreciate it. You. Thank you. Um, just lastly, um, if I may present some books to you tonight um, that will be coming to you likely next week. Um, so I, because we only have a week between um, cycles, I wanted to see if I can present books tonight. Is that all right, uh, Vice President Lori? <laughs> we'll take books anytime. Thank you.
this will be a book coming to you, recommendation for um, the English department at the high school. Dr. Rundle, um, one question on this whole process. I, I think anybody watching this would probably want to know, or yes. it would be kind of, uh, is there a schedule for the other languages that would, haven't been discussed, that like such as Spanish and English options? Yes, so Spanish will come to you in June. Um, uh, uh, the issue for them is even more so um, than French, there's even more text to select from from Spanish, and they have a larger department as well. And so, trying they're they're not quite as nimble as having just two teachers or three teachers. They you know they've got a bigger department um, and weighing a lot of different options. So they weren't quite ready to come forward. Um, I could have kept them all together, but just because I know we're probably going to see a math text perhaps coming, as well as an AP U.S. History text, just to pace it out a little better. Um, but that's what's on the horizon there. So. And if you wouldn't mind just um, letting for people at home, if they want to be following on with the text, Shh. can you just let us know what it is? Yes, so everything I never told you um, is a text that um, has come through kind of as a first read through the IMC. Um, the IMC, in light of some of the conversations that were taking place in the community uh, this fall, um, with respect to um, content matter and text, the IMC asked for an extra week to be able to read the text um, more carefully and or consider it, and then they are weighing in through their vote through a Google form through me. Um, so this particular text uh, would be available for 9th, 10th, or 11th grade. Um, it's really 9th grade who wants to use it in the second semester. Um, but there are some 11th grade teachers who are saying, well, those, my current students haven't used that text, and that looks like a great one um, to take a look at. So this is being proposed as, um, as part of a, the ongoing efforts to diversify text and also modernize text. We do have some texts that have um, the experience of um, this particular one with an Asian American family. However, um, you know, it is not nearly as modern as this one. Even though this story takes place in the 70s and 80s, the author is very current and it's a 2015 publication from this. So, yeah. You're back. Wonderful, thank you. Yep. That leads us to um, Board Policy 1800 OE3, Communication to Support the Board for proposed funding and waiver application for excess snow days. Okay. So Erin is making her way to just an update. The novel will be on the agenda for next week. Next week. And because we don't have that two week usual pattern, that's why Fred wanted to give it to you tonight. So It'd yeah, I just wanted you to have plenty of time. And it still could be a first read, and then at the later meeting yep. in um, April, you'll be able to make the decision on this one as well. So you've got lots of time to, and spring break, to have some reading done. Yeah. <laughs> so moving forward to um, the waiver, we had some snow days in February, if you didn't hear. Um, five of them actually, and um, our calendar had built into it three of those days that um, can be made up, but there are still two days left, and so there is a process that staff has to go through in um, requesting a waiver for those other two student days. Um, some of it was to make sure that we have the correct number of instructional minutes for our students. Some districts um, are not eligible to apply for a waiver to um, waive any of the days and, and are required to make them up because they didn't have the um, instructional minutes, which we do. Erin has prepared the um, letter to OSPI in working with OSPI to make sure that we had exactly what they're looking for in their approval. Erin. Yeah, essentially, the document, sorry, the document sort of speaks for itself. It outlines the fact that we missed five days, what days we are making up through our scheduled snow days. We're fortunate in that our calendar did include um, weather makeup days, and those days were after the major snowstorm. Um, and then the two days that we are applying for for continued state support, you could only apply if we, if you had, or if the district had the mandatory minimum um, or threshold of student contact minutes, which thanks to um, 
Executive Director Bergstrom and Rundle, we've confirmed that we do. And so we're eligible for that. And for that reason, we need your sign off though before we can present it to SPI because it has to be um, a declaration on behalf of the superintendent that it is supported by the board. And this is just applying to the students, correct? This doesn't have anything to do with the teachers because they're under contract to work two extra days? Could you repeat the yeah, last this part of the This just applies question? to the students, not the teachers. Is that correct for the waiving of those days? We are working with the um, MIA. MIA leadership mm -hmm. in working through the logistics okay. for staff. Okay. Thank you. Looks great. I also think it's worth mentioning that it's so great that we plan for um, mm -hmm. snow days in our schedule. Um, and I know we did that because many years ago uh, we had so many snow days that tacking them all on at the end of the year was daunting. And so um, that became a practice. And it's nice when we don't have to use them and we get a day off mid-year. And it's great when uh, we do have to use them so that we don't have to tack it all on at the end of the year. So thanks to the administration for continuing that practice and bringing those calendars to us. So I just want to um, open for discussion in terms of the pros and cons of not making up instructional time that we have. Um, there's, you know, I mean, we talk about, um, we talk about how precious uh, student learning time is. And um, in asking this question, I'm not stating that there aren't really good reasons to waive this, um, but has, was this addressed by the leadership team? We certainly discussed how could we make up, so to speak, those other two days. Um, there were, would be a lot of different ways to do that. There would certainly be adding more days at the end of the year. There would be looking at um, other current days that are um, off, such as spring break. Could you make them up during spring break? There's always the potential for Saturdays, which really doesn't get a lot of attendance on. We discussed um, could we make up the time by virtue of um, early release and what would that look like for scheduling for transportation and staff and how would we um, be able to manipulate the early releases and was there enough there. Um, did receive unsolicited some uh, support from parents just via emails saying we vote for the waiver, um, really pushing even after the first snow day, when are we getting out, when are we getting out wanting to know what the schedule was so that they could um, adjust their schedule if needed um, for June in particular. And so when we were able to come to the conclusion that we had the minutes required by the waiver and knew that we had those three days in there, um, in light of adding after a weekend two more days, it felt that this was um, probably the best solution for everyone. Thank you. Do, any questions or comments? Um, are other school districts kind of following suit, or what's your general feeling about that? There's several. Um, there are districts that did not qualify, so I, I can tell you that right away. In fact, some of our um, districts that we communicate with, when we had a superintendent call on it for PSESD, and some didn't bother calling in because they couldn't apply for the waiver. They don't have the minutes. Um, in fact, Issaquah, um, I know Assistant Superintendent Rundle's children probably aren't very happy because they have to make up all those days because they didn't have the minimum. Um, so different districts are doing it. It's a local decision, um, are doing it differently. Most that have snow days embedded in are using, of course, all of those snow days to make up days and then um, asking for a waiver beyond that. Surprised to see some asked for some pretty big chunks of days for waivers, um, more than two. Um, some are just one. It just kind of depended on how many they have in. Um, some of districts south of us that had to take days and had already missed some days during, due to strike action. They have, um, of course, not been able to um, ask for waivers as well because they already missed some days, so they are, are not doing a waiver. 
so it does kind of vary as to how many days people are, are asking for the waiver. I've seen in our region on a spreadsheet that was created, um, I think someone asked us up to five, but the general seemed to be around the two and three range. How does it uh, impact our seniors at all? Graduation date stays the same. Graduation date will stay the same. And so they'll be short one of their added days. Right. And then it's probably hard to add days uh, to the end because the AP schedules and things like that uh, those don't, don't, those don't, don't change. move. Yeah. So the teachers have to get their content in by the time of the test. Correct. Yes, there is a, a fair amount of pressure and stress around that right now because of those missed days. Um, people trying to catch up without, I mean, we have some of the days that we've been able to make up. We just had one recently, um, but the test day at the same time, there was no provision to move those at all. So even with our um, SBA, it is still going as mm -hmm. anticipated. Our elementary are in the throes of it this week um, because there was no, no adjustment allowed. Thank you for that uh, in-depth analysis. Um, we're taking action on this now, I assume. Yes. Okay. I move we approve this letter uh, to OSPI regarding the um, makeup days uh, waiver. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? The uh, board approves the letter for a proposed funding and waiver application. Um, we will move on. Thank you. Um, we will move on to full governance process monitoring language review. Um, before we start this, I know we approved the agenda as written. Um, we, the board did in executive session, exempt, executive session this week, um, had a discussion about some of these um, topics and uh, there was talk about whether or not we wanted some more time uh, to have a study session regarding um, these uh, board policies prior to uh, reviewing and monitoring the language. Um, so I will just open that for discussion and see what everyone thinks uh, the best way to proceed. So um, I, I'd be interested if anyone has any language updates tonight uh, for this. I, I did not have any language updates. I think there are kind of two things to look at. One is uh, other language updates on around this. Two would be for the board to have a study session around um, some, of, some of these policies and just un uh, understand them and get to a set of norms uh, that this board uses. I, I think it would be nice to have the norms first, study session first, and understand that before we change language. But you know, if if somebody had language suggestions, it might help us understand the content of the study session as well. So with that in mind, I would suggest kind of two things. One, we table the language updates today. Two, we make a motion to have the study session that the president and vice president will schedule at a time that is convenient. And then maybe number three, we could have some discussion around the, if there's anything else we want to do in that study session beyond what we've talked about. I don't know if that's needed to schedule the study session or not, but uh, those would be kind of the th two to three things we need to do. I think given that there's been some question around um, board policies 1002 and 1003 uh, that we should postpone those, I think I'd also like to have our full board present for that and not try to do anything about it tonight. Um, so given that, I'll make a motion that we postpone language review for 
Board Policy 1002 and Board Policy 1003 uh, to a later date to be determined later. Are you not including Board Policy 1004? Um, I didn't see that there were any issues with that, but if anybody w feels like there are and they want to amend my motion after it gets seconded, does it need to be seconded first? It would. I just wanted to make sure that that yeah, was intentional. It was intentional. Okay. I mean, I w in reviewing these before the meeting, I felt like um, the 1004 has to do with um, the board and superintendent relationship and when we do all the monitorings of these various board policies and that um, item D um, OE 11 is completely unrelated. Uh, it's about facilities and capital assets. It seems like that's something we could take on tonight or just at least vote on separately. So we have a motion to postpone a review of board policy 1002 and 1003. Do we have a second? I second. Is there any further discussion? Yeah, the only, the only thing I could see is um, if there are no language changes, we make no language changes tonight. We have our review uh, study session and then come back as a board and bring the policies we care about uh, to the table. It's, uh, you know, I think the policies we care about looking at in the study session, at least in uh, some of them are listed in 1004. For example, uh, unity of control uh, would be one that has come up as well so you know I, I don't know the best way to do to to really do this we're kind of in a in a policy hole right here as to do we ha do we want to leave these things hanging over our head and keep pushing them out and postponing them we don't know what date we'll really review it right now or is it better to say there are no changes now do our study session have a new motion that b adds to the agenda when we care about it, what we want to actually do. I, I don't know how you, how you handle postponing something indefinitely. Any other comments? Um, I think there might be a, there, there could be a, a partial compromise by just including 1004 into Tracy's or uh, Director Drinkwater's uh, motion. However, it, uh, uh, that motion does postpone that decision, so there, there's a slight difference right now what's being discussed. Um, I, and towards that end, I'm kind of still thinking about that. So really, I think what's on the table is, are we okay postponing them, or do we just want to say there are no changes now and move forward with the study session? Because in, in effect, we can come back to these at any point. I'm in favor of postponing them. Um, I, I myself have some questions in my own mind about what would be the best way to proceed, and I think we would benefit from further discussion on it. Um, for 1002 and 1003, I, I have one slight change on 1004 that um, is just a redundancy, but um, I'm, I'm happy to include that in a postponement as well. That's totally fine. So the motion before us that's been uh, made and seconded is to postpone uh, the monitoring language review of board policy one. 2002 and 1003. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Abstain. I'm abstaining. I still, I still, I was still thinking a little bit of it, so I really wasn't prepared to vote. So oh, I, I I'm sorry. I apologize. Um, so I don't know where we are in terms of the whole. Um, I just didn't see any other comments coming, yeah. so I was No, I, I, I get that, and I, I had also talked, and I, I, you know, I, I, I think I told people that I was thinking, and then, but I didn't want to 
chime in twice. So, but I don't know where this vote leaves us with respect to Robert's rules and stuff like that. You can go ahead and revote. You can uh, you can go ahead and call for a revote on that. That's fine. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, can I jump in real quick? I sure. thought I maybe heard an amendment that was perhaps suggested to the original motion of including um, 1004, but I'm not sure if that was I don't think that officially was formalized. motioned and formalized. I don't think that was formalized, but I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, so I do appreciate uh, Director D'Souza's suggestion that we have, um, I think, a study session to kind of understand uh, the existing language because I think there is something to be said for everybody getting on the same page of the existing language before going uh, further. Um, I don't know if Director Drinkwater's proposal necessarily negates that idea. I think you're just suggesting that we postpone it till uh, the entire board is present for that decision. And if, if uh, it's only going to take an additional week for us to come back to that table, I think that's okay to uh, postpone this whole, to essentially table this. Um, I would suggest we just table this until we meet next week. Do you mean all four or just the three of them if we amend it with uh, the conclusion? Table all three. I didn't see any concern with facilities. Okay. I will amend my original motion um, to include uh, board policy 1004. So postponing all three items A, B, and C. Do we have a second? <laughs> I'll second it. Any discussion? Yeah, I'm, uh, I guess I'm, I'm confused what we're, <laughs> what we're doing. Are we going to re-vote on this again next week? Is that the idea? No, I think it's, it's, are we going to vote on it today or are we going to postpone it? And we didn't, um, I don't think we've decided if we do postpone it exactly how we're going to deal with it. I personally would like to have a discussion, as Director Jorgensen just said, about um, what these policies mean to this board um, so that we're all on the same page when we're deciding whether or not it's appropriate to do a language review. I don't think we're ready to do that. Um, I think approving this at this point is, uh, well, it's not that it's premature. It's I, I don't see the point. Of course, we can always bring it back. Um, we can talk about setting a deadline for it. I think certainly by the end of um, the school year, I don't know what our schedules are in terms of, of scheduling a study session. Um, but unless, unless anyone has suggestions for language review, um, I think it will be a lot more meaningful discussion once we're able to get on the same page. And I don't think we'll be ready next week either I th because I don't think we'll have, unless we do some discussion at next week's meeting, but regardless, I think that's up to the president and vice president to schedule um, that on the agenda. But we could certainly bring it up as a discussion item um, at next week's meeting. I think uh, my, my other concern was there were other policies that are in this area as well that are related to, but not these two, that have been, that have been brought up. Um, and so are, are, we, are we not allowing changes? You know, they might, as we, as we progress through our study session, it might not just be these two policies that we think about impacting, but other related policies that were also introduced uh, last week. So I'm just con concerned, are we constraining ourselves to just updating these two and not other ones? Are we making these two easier to update and perhaps making other ones harder to update? Just a reminder that in a study, study session, you're not going to be taking any action, but if you're looking at policies, um, you would certainly wouldn't have to restrict it to just these ones so that at a time when you brought these back, you um, could also then say, and we'd also like to address these ones, which could then be agen put on the agenda for future as well. If that fits within policy, <laughs> I'm, I'm good with that then. <laughs> 
can I speak to how I understand this right now? Just because I want to make sure that uh, my understanding is similar to other people's understanding um, and that I'm not either behind the curve or ahead of the curve. Um, I, I believe uh, Director Drinkwater's motion uh, has it been amended yet? Second. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, is to table this discussion till we meet next. <laughs> um, and, and, and I'll just state my preference. My preference is I hope that this board decides um, to do a study session to understand where we are on interpreting these um, uh, policies before uh, entertaining suggested changes. Because right now I think there's uh, different interpretations around the table and if we start suggesting changes, that's gonna be really confusing. That's what I was trying to say. Okay, um, thanks. Um, and that's probably exactly what you said. I just, I'm just trying to make sure I understood it. Um, so, yeah. Is there, are we all on the same place? <laughs> At least in terms of understanding, not necessarily agreeing, but understanding. Thank you. I think that clarified it, hopefully, for everybody. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Are we ready to Okay. <laughs> are we ready to revote? Yes. We will be revoting uh, to the, am actually, it's not a revote because right, there's an, an amendment. amendment. Um, and the motion is to postpone monitoring language review of board policy 1002, 1003, and 1004. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, then we will postpone those. Um, do I have a motion uh, to uh, create at a study session to discuss um, intent of these policies, if not others that are related to it. So moved. Second. Any discussion? I don't actually think we need a motion. I think the president and vice president could just do that, but, but I think if you wanna vote, I'm happy to vote and approve it. I, I think we're all on the same page, so I'll just call for a vote. And all in favor? Aye. 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 I was going to say, is there any other discussion? Oh, I'm sorry. See if you wanted to say something. Okay. <laughs> there sorry. certainly. What what I can say is, I think I can say, um, is that there certainly um, can be input with regards to uh, the topics for the study session. I don't think that we're limited. We're, what we, I don't think the motion is not to limit to these three. It's to um, include anything relating to the different interpretations. Right. Thank you for that that's clarification. A, that's a yes. great agreement, I like that. Um, so all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Any abstentions? Um, so what I would, and so the motion passes, I would um, just suggest that any, if any board member wants a particular policy um, discussed in the study session that they email our president so that we know what can be on the agenda for the study session, if it isn't one of these three. Um, moving to monitoring language review for board policy 1800 OE 11, facilities and capital projects. Um, I move we approve um, the this is language review as well, yeah. The language of uh, OE 11 facilities and capital assets. I don't think we need a motion unless there was a change made. Oh, good point. Um, is there any discussion or any suggestions on any language changes? Then that is, con the discussion is concluded. Um, moving forward to our consent agenda. Make the motion that we approve the consent agenda. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. The consent agenda is approved. Um, we're gonna move on to number seven, superintendent's report. Nothing further at this time. Make sure your calendar's marked for next <laughs> Thursday. I think that's my only reminder, and I've said it several times tonight, so <laughs> no one will forget. 
Okay, so we are moving to board announcements, inquiries, inquiries, and reports, and would love to hear from our legislative representative. I'm going to table that for next week. There's a lot of things changing, and I'm sure, yeah. Thank you. Um, I don't know if there's been a YFS stakeholder meeting report discussion. I'm going to suggest that we table that, too, since uh, one of our representatives right now is... is not at the table, so why don't we wait talk about that next time we meet. That sounds fine. I do want to um, just raise the question of um, we wanted to have these reports so that we're on all on the same page in terms of the process, so just make sure that it's still, I mean, I certainly think it's appropriate for next week to stay on the agenda, but whether or not we still want to be having these reports and discussions. Um, at every meeting like we are now. So just something to think about. Um, and uh, we'll move on to see board reports. Um, yeah, I guess two items. One, uh, I was at the Lakeridge PAC uh, where uh, Dada and Andreeves presented the, the mission, vision, and values uh, to the uh, Principal's Advisory Committee. Was, uh, it was the uh, first time I've seen the presentation. Well, it was uh, well done, as well as the tool that allowed people to provide their input. Uh, that was also very well done and uh, very effective way of their whole group providing input, as well as seeing uh, previous respondents, so you get, get an idea of what to comment on. I think there was some feedback given, uh, or, or at least questions asked around what has the board input been around this? And I know we've spent, uh, starting with uh, Tracy as president, we started over a year ago and spending a, quite a bit of time on that. But I think it's, it was an interesting question because I think at the same time, while the board has vested about a, over a year's worth of time on it, I think we're still very open to input and changes from our community, students, partners. And I don't want, uh, I didn't really f want the, uh, board's investment to get in the way of people thinking this is an immutable um, document at this point. So other than that, I think it went uh, went really well, and uh, not other than that, I think that, I just get it, making being clear about that was good. Uh, it went really well, so I really enjoyed the session and the feedback from people. The other one I'll say uh, I loved um, Fine Arts uh, Night I attended yesterday. Uh, the Two things that struck me, uh, the Lego mural. You could go build a piece of the, put your Lego together and put it towards a mural, awesome. And uh, the kids and the Spanish song that they sung. Wow, that was uh, pretty fluent Spanish there. <laughs> so uh, very thrilled by that. No report. Uh, no report other than when I was driving here. I think I saw that the state legislature um, has agreed to make vaping the legal age at 21, and I think that's potentially a wonderful opportunity to mitigate um, children getting access to that. Um, just briefly, I had the opportunity to go to um, the Fine Arts on Tuesday, um, which I've actually never been to just the art portion and saw all the activities. Um, and uh, it was a really great experience. There was a lot of interaction and different activities for um, young and old, um, older. And uh, it was just, a, it was a great experience and a real excellent opportunity to see what is happening in our district with the fine arts from the music to the um, visual arts. Um, so thank you for uh, to the um, arts count fine arts advisory council for all of their hard work for this and um, throughout the year um, helping to improve and provide opportunities for fine arts in our district. Um, that reaches the end of our meeting. Um, so I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? And we are adjourning at 728.